Well, thank you for joining us today for the Ultron Lecture Series this week. Um, I'm pretty excited. We're going to continue on with our theme of musculoskeletal ultrasound today. And I've invited a good friend and a colleague uh, from across town, Ben Boswell, to talk to us today about musculoskeletal ultrasound. So he's one of our MSK experts, or actually one of the MSK experts over at University Hospitals, does a lot with our local sports teams. And so I think he's going to bring a unique perspective on ultrasound, bedside ultrasound, and MSK. So without taking more time, Ben, go ahead and take it away. And thank you so much for being part of today's lecture series. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Matt. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, nice to be back. I haven't given this talk for a couple of years, so I had to, to dust it off a couple of days ago and, and make a few changes to it. So um, for those of you who don't know me again, my name is Ben Boswell. I'm a emergency medicine doctor. I did my residency in Miami Beach, Florida at Mount Sinai and then out of my fellowship in sports medicine at Duke University. And so I have a dual practice where I do both emergency medicine and sports medicine. So um, I like it because it gives me a pretty good uh, perspective, both in the emergency department and in the sports medicine clinic. So I kind of uh, use uh, both um, to make me better in both areas, which is great. I do a ton of ultrasound. So this talk is, is more basic stuff. I'm talking about basic uh, uh, MSK ultrasound uh, anatomy, a little bit of uh, the actual physics talk a little bit about some uh, common procedures that can be done in the emergency department that I do in the clinic. And I also do in the emergency department. So I kind of try to do a few of the procedures that way to kind of give you guys an idea of what, what that looks like. Um, I'm sports medicine, so I make a lot of sports medicine references. So I apologize in advance if that bores you. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll take it away here. So, um, so disclosure, sadly, um, I still don't have any have been um, basic objectives for this talk are again, under basic concepts of musculoskeletal ultrasound. Um, we're gonna talk about anatomical structures. We're gonna talk about pathological findings. And then again, we're gonna talk about some, some procedures. Okay, so, so when it comes to uh, musculoskeletal focus, okay, probe selection is going to uh, also determine your, um, Matt, can you hear me? Cause I just got a notification that my internet is not working. Yeah, it's pausing here and there, but we'll keep rolling with it and see how it goes. Okay. Can you, if I vanish, can you just call myself and let me know? <laughs> because we'll I do. keep getting these pop-ups. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so your probe selection depends on what you're trying to find, right? So, um, you know, it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm trying to look at deeper structures and bigger fields of view, I'm going to use the semi-lunar probe. It's going to give me um, more depth. The problem is it's not going to give me If I'm looking more towards superficial structures, I'll go all the way here to the rest of your screen, which is what we, what we call a hockey puck. Um, then this is very low depth and very high detail. So, so it all kind of depends on what you're doing. And so your probe selection is super important based on what you're looking for. We're going to talk briefly about all the movements. Okay. So, um, you know, common in, uh, in, in shooting and gunmanship, you know, the, the phrase aim small, miss small also correlates well with ultrasound. So, you know, it's a very small um, movements make very big differences on the screen. So that's what's really important to note. Um, and then, I like to look at everything, almost everything I can. Okay. Um, probe orientation and musculoskeletal ultrasound is a little bit different than it is in traditional focus. You know, in traditional focus, your, your indicator is always either to the patient's right. Um, it's totally different in musculoskeletal ultrasound. There really is no standard orientation or universal orientation. So what, I, what we teach the fellows is put your probe in a perspective that you can see your own that. Okay. So it's more, more dependent on the user. Okay. Again, these are the basic movements. You've got sliding, rotating, tilting, rocking. I don't expect anyone to really remember these. Just know that they exist, okay? So what's also really important when you're doing musculoskeletal ultrasound is actually how you hold the probe. Because again, when we talk about the aim small, miss small concepts, you know, if you're holding the probe incorrectly and you turn your head to look at the screen or you look across to look at the screen, your, your field is totally going to change because un undoubtedly when you move your head or move your shoulders, your hands, and your whole field of view is going to change. So what we like to do is, I, you know, if you look at the set, left side of your screen, this is the correct way to hold the probe. So you want to definitely anchor a couple, one or two fingers on the patient, um, and then that helps you keep your movement as little as humanly possible. So while you're moving around doing things, grabbing needles to do procedures, or you know, to actually doing the procedure, you want to have definitely have an anchor so that your field of view does not change that much. And then if you look to the middle and the right hand side of the screen. I strongly urge not to hold the probe like this because again, it's going to be around you and it's going to be totally different than how it did just a second ago. Okay. Also, something to note is you can, these probes are uh, 
they're water resistant. So you can, like if you're looking at very superficial structures um, and you don't have enough gel to get it, you can always put things like the hand or the foot in a tub of water. And that gives you a great, uh, great image because um, the sound waves do not pass well through air. So they need water, they need gel. So you can always do things like this to make it a little bit better. Okay, so again, things we can see, fractures, dislocations, fusions, tendon injuries, ligament injuries, muscle injuries, so on and so forth, nerves, cartilage, uh, fluid-filled structures. And then what's really nice about musculoskeletal ultrasound, you can see dynamic images. They see snapping, triggering, sublocation, tendon tears, there's nothing things like that, which is really nice. Okay, so things that you don't necessarily see as well on MRI, you can see better with ultrasound and vice versa. Okay, what's also really important to note about ultrasound is this, um, this artifact called anisotropy. Okay, so what's really important about this is if your beam is not lined up really well with the structure, it's going to make it look like there's something wrong or there's a tear. So if you look at this image here, um, this is a totally normal tendon, but if you look at it kind of on this side of the screen, the left side of this picture, it's right in line, it's perpendicular, so you have nice view of the fibular structure, whereas as it dives down and as it goes more oblique to the sound of the, or the, well, the sound waves, the ultrasound waves, um, it's gonna look different, it's gonna look abnormal. So that's really important to note that if a structure doesn't look normal to you, change your program orientation, tilt, waggle, things like that, and you'll see that where it looks abnormal, once you get that in the correct view, it will look much, much more normal or correct. Okay, and so this is just a nice little picture I like to show, and this just kind of uh, describes how anisotropy works. Uh, again, this is just basic, basic stuff, but you can see how that could change your image. So that's super important when you're looking at a lot of ligaments and things like that, muscles, because very rarely are they just simply perpendicular or or um, or parallel. Okay, so um, you have to kind of move your probe around to get those views where you need to look at. Okay, so we're going to talk about normal structures as well. So muscle. Muscle is relatively hypoechoic and um, heterogeneous, okay, because you have these, um, the, the paramecium, the fiber adipose is a little bit less or hypoechoic, so it's going to look a little bit mixed, heterogeneous. And as you can see, as you change your orientation, so on the left hand side of your screen, you're looking at the muscle in a parallel plane, and then you can see, you can see that nice structure is coming across, whereas when you turn 90 degrees, it looks a lot more hypoechoic because you're looking at it at a different angle, okay. And both of these are totally normal appearing on your. On your, um, on your screen. Tendon's a little bit different. It's uh, more hyperchoic or fiber-like or fibrillar extra echo texture because you think about the density of a, ten of a tendon, it's much tighter, okay? And those structures sit very tight on top of each other, so then you're gonna have this very fibrillar structure. And then when you look at that in 90 degree angle or in uh, other view, you're gonna see that it also looks pretty, pretty um, hyperchoic, again, because the structures are much tighter in that area, okay? Ligaments, can be a lot more difficult to see because ligaments are generally much, much more compact than tendons. So ligaments can be pretty tough and their, their appearance can actually change a little bit depending on where they are. So if you're looking at it over fiber cartilage, as you can see here, it's gonna look a little bit more hyperchoic. Whereas if you, when you see that ligament come over the bone in reference to the bone, it's, it's gonna actually look hypoechoic. So ligaments can be a little bit different to pace, depending on where you're looking at them. Just know that they're there, they're pretty hard to see. Um, and they just look like basically very, very tight or much, much more dense like or uh, tendons, okay? Bone, very easy to see, okay? Because it's very dense. So if you look at the structures here, it's gonna look very bright on your screen. Um, and then if you look underneath here, you get this rever reverberation artifact, which you can get quite frequently. So what you're seeing underneath the cortex of the bone is really just artifact. You're not really seeing anything reliable on your screen. You're simply seeing artifact in the bone because it's so dense and, and the physics of the, the sound waves bouncing back to the probe. So just know that once you hit bone, really, really difficult to rely on what you're seeing underneath that because it's really it's mostly artifact. Okay. And then look at the side, right side, hand side of the screen. This is just a, a femoral head sitting in the um, in the hip joint here, the femoral your joint. And you can see your acetabulum here and your, your femoral head. Okay. So cartilage looks a little bit different depending on what kind of cartilage you're looking at. So your hyaline cartilage is going to look very slick. It's going to be very, very dense and it's going to be hypoechoic. Okay. Whereas your fiber cartilage is more fibrous tissue. It's going to be more hyperchoic and a little bit more heterogeneous appearance. So if you look here, here's your um, the hyaline cartilage on the on the uh, distal femur here, and underneath you see this fiber cartilage from the meniscus. So you see how much differently how different the appearances are based on what you're looking at. Okay. Nerves can be a little tough too. So nerves, they take on this more particular appearance. They um, can look in short axis, they're pretty easy to pick up. 
Um, if you look at this honeycomb or wag of real appearance here on the top right of the screen, this is looking at in short axis, whereas when you go to long axis, it looks a lot like a pendant, okay? So um, you have to be really careful about that. And one way to tell the difference between the two is actually just having them, you know, for instance, if you look at the wrist, your tendons, your muscles are going to move, whereas your nerve should stay pretty, pretty, uh, uh, pretty static. But it also can move a little bit. So that's one thing to know too, that they can look very similar. So you have to be really careful when you're looking at structures to discern what you're looking at. Okay, and that's another reason why it's really good to look at this both long axis and short axis because it's very easy to pick them up. Okay, so I did want to talk also about. Um, so now we kind of talk about human tissue and we start talking about how things look pathologic. Okay, so. When you look at muscle tear versus muscle tear, if you think about it. Um, so on the left hand side of the screen here, you're looking at uh, kind of more scar formation. So it's been a tear, it's scarring down, so the tissue's going to be more heterogeneous. It's not going to have a nice uniform appearance to the rest of the muscle. Whereas if you look at the right hand side of the screen, this is more of an acute tear. The muscle is actually torn. It's filled with hematoma, seroma fluid, and that's going to be, uh, as you know, fluid looks dark, so it's going to look more hypocopier. Okay, so if you see the difference there. Tear, tear, acute tears, the scars are going to look a little, little bit different. Okay. So, and I, I kind of want to show you normal versus abnormal. So, if you look at the left hand side of the screen here, you see nice, um, nice echo texture of the muscle here. You see a nice fascial, uh, myofascial plane here. Um, whereas you look at the injury, so if you look at the scar, it's, you know, in time, it's going to lay down the fibrous tissue. It's not really uh, formed as well as the regular muscle tissue. Um, and then it kind of gives that heterogeneous and hypoclosed appearance. Whereas up below, you have this more acute tear, fluid, hematoma, and it's going to look more hypoclosed. Okay. So now let's talk about uh, tendonitis, tendocinibitis. They all kind of are somewhat similar, but a little bit different. But just know that if you have quite a bit of tendonitis, so if you look here, you're going to have a normal tendon. It's not a lot of fluid around that tendon on the left hand side of the screen. Whereas when you go to the right hand side of the screen, you see all this fluid around the tendon, um, this kind of irritation. You know, I like patients it's essentially edema just fluid and, and irritation around that tendon and you can see that quite well so if you see normal tendon here um, this is an asymptomatic patient then you see a very symptomatic uh, tenosynovitis tendonitis patient here okay and then if you look at it in short axis so you flip your probe now this is looking at an extensor compartment of the wrist look on the left hand side of the screen that's you know a little bit of fluid around there is totally normal it's physiologic but if you look at the right hand side of the screen you can see all this extra fluid um, this is probably a really symptomatic extensor digitorum compartment. And, and this is kind of what you'll see with these symptomatic patients, okay? So, and it's really tough to say. So then the common question is, well, how much is, is abnormal? It's really hard to say, everyone's a little bit different. So what I like to do is I like to compare asymptomatic and symptomatic. And if I see these findings, I'm a little bit more convinced, okay? So I did also want to talk about fractures. Generally, if you're worried about a uh, fracture, you're gonna get radiographs, but sometimes there may be little subtle things in radiographs that you can't really tell. The nice thing is to do is just put an ultrasound probe on there. And sometimes it can be more obvious, like if you look at the right side of the screen, you have a pretty obvious displaced fracture here. But whereas on the left, it's very small, but you can see this little break in the cortex. Okay. And so that's something to note too, is you can also use ultrasound to see, see uh, fractures, which is, which is helpful sometimes. Okay. I'm not going to go really deep into this, but this is kind of more osteomyelitis. Also quite helpful if you have that diabetic patient with some overlying cellulitis or, or unexplained pain, elevated BSR, CRP, and they're complaining a lot of like deep, achy, throbbing bone pain, bony pain. Um, you can also throw an ultrasound on there and you can tell. So like, you know, I've done this in the ER too, if I've had a little bit of concern, um, I'll just throw an ultrasound probe on there. And you can tell, you can de definitely tell the difference between kind of superficial edematous tissue with cellulitis versus like actual um, osteomyelitis. You should see this kind of, you see the bone destruction here. You'll see a hypochloric abscesses and edema along with hyperchloric areas. And there can be some gas in those areas too that can cause this really bright appearance. Okay, so just know that you can use that. It works pretty well. Okay, um, something else you can do really nicely with ultrasound is you can look at actually tendon tears, lacerations, things like that. So if you look here, you have a normal tendon kind of the top left here. And if you look at the bottom right, you see this normal echo texture, fibrillary structure. And you see this, this kind of hypochloric gap right here. So this is a partial tendon tear. Here, okay, and again, these are really easy to see with ultrasound things that you don't see nearly as well. Um, certainly, you can see MRIs as well, but in the ER, we don't have access to MRIs that much, so this is really helpful in that situation. Um, this is something we see not uncommonly in the ER as well, these, um, especially in the trauma centers, 
part of these, uh, you know, fall off of motorcycle. They have these big fluid filled structures and these Lamar Alabama lesions. Okay. So nice thing about this is sometimes these patients, you know, they have this really unexplained kind of tissue swelling and you're really not sure if it's Lamar Alabama lesion. You're not sure if it's an abscess. You can throw an ultrasound. It looks really good. You know, so this patient, for instance, had um, an MRI of their knee. Um, because there was this all this soft uh, tissue swelling, there was concern from their provider that they had a uh, a effusion through an ultrasound on there. You can see really, really well this this fluid filled structure. This isn't this patient, but I had a very similar patient. I found the images as close as I could find. But you can see you can put an ultrasound on there, you can see really well this fluid filled structure in between the tissues, which is nice. Okay. So I do want to start. So that all said, we're gonna kind of start talking about some, some pathology. I'm gonna start with the elbow and I'm gonna kind of work work down. Again, you know, not uncommon things we may see. So, you know, talking about ligament here. So now we're going to talk about the, the ulnar collateral ligament. I like this. I like to use this option because for this structure, because it's pretty easily seen on ultrasound. It's, as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, it's a very big ligament structure, very broad, which is nice because it's pretty easy to see on ultrasound. Okay, so if you look here, um, looks, you know, looking on ultrasound here, this is nice uniform structure. You see this nice tight, fibrillary structure here, the tendon, the, tend the uh, ligament looks intact, which is really good, okay? So when you have these tears, these are some findings you'll see. So you can see that structure there. You can see there's a tear, so there's fluid here. You can see that disruption down the outside part of that ligament complex there, and you can see this here. And then also, different patient, but you can see a little bit further down, it looks totally abnormal, okay? So you don't see that nice ligament coming across. You kind of see this hypochloric region tear, and then again, We'll show normal versus abnormal. So this is nice and uniform, well-appearing ulnar collateral ligament, whereas you can see tears here and here. Okay, so that's a nice thing to ultrasound and show you. This is something we see in the ER pretty frequently. I see it in my clinic pretty frequently. Um, it seems like a pretty obvious uh, olecranon bursitis, right? Um, you know, patients like to see that. So you could say, hey, look, you know, you do an ultrasound, put a probe there, you can see all this fluid sitting around in that bursa, okay, which is really nice, easy, easy tool. You can show them, say, hey, this is exactly what this is. And then we're going to talk later about, uh, later on, talk about what you can do about it. But this is nice, really, really easy, fast test to do. You don't need to get radiographs or anything like that. It's really easy. Okay. Something else patients come in frequently is, is the old ganglion cyst, right? So um, you see this swelling, you know, you throw, again, throw an ultrasound in there, make sure it's not something else kind of funny. And, and it's pretty easy to see with a ganglion cyst. So if you look over here, um, you can actually see a tiny little possible cyst right here, but relatively this looks quite normal. Whereas you look here on the right hand side of the screen, you can see this extensor tendon here, and then you've got this big swelling over here. So that's you know the typical appearance of the ganglion cyst. Um, pretty easy to show them, and again, easy diagnosis to make. Okay. Other things um, you can see this in the ER sometimes. This is usually more of our fast track or micro areas. The patients come in with this kind of overuse wrist pain. Um, you know, commonly we like to diagnose or like the, uh, you know, we'll see this decor vein synovitis, easy diagnosis to make with ultrasound too. So if you have a normal structure here, again, a little bit of fluid around these tendons is relatively normal. But if you see over here, this is a pretty symptomatic um, first extensor compartment. You see the extensor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis longus, and you see this fluid kind of sitting around it. Here. So this is uh, more likely a symptomatic decor veins or, or uh, extensor tendonitis. And then intersection syndrome is something we see pretty frequently too. Um, that's kind of more or less uh, uh, intersectional compartments one and two on top of each other. And what can happen there is that can also get really irritated with these repetitive wrist motions. Uh, normal, you'll see extensor compartment number two sliding over one, not a lot of fluid, looks really normal. Whereas someone symptomatic, you're gonna see all this fluid, you're gonna see a track in between the two compartments. And this again is a very symptomatic tennis and device, okay? So, um, this is usually when I kind of open it to the group and where first I ask who this is, you know, um, that kind of gives away what it is. But this being on Zoom, it's a little bit difficult, so I'm just going to talk through it. So this is uh, JJ Watt. Um, he had an injury on the field. He had a, what we call an acute traumatic swollen knee, okay? Um, three traumatic causes of acute hemarthrosis. So this is what I kind of teach our residents and fellows. Someone comes in, they injure their knee, and they come in with a big, heavy swollen knee. Like within hours of the injury, it's generally going to be three different things. Okay, so it's going to be either an ACL tear, uh, patellar dislocation, or tubular plantar fracture. Okay, the nice thing is if someone dislocated their patella, they're going to tell you to dislocate their patella. They're going to describe it pretty well, or they'll come in with it still dislocated. The reason that causes some swelling is that medial retinaculum bleeds into the joint, causes that to get really small. 
ACL ruptures and tibial head fractures, they're going to give you more of an insidious story. You know, I twisted, turned, hit my knee, felt a pop, my knee really swollen, got really swollen. And so your management is going to be very different. For both. Okay. So, you know, an ACL tear, ER, it's not that important. Okay. We'll have them follow up, nothing acute, but a tibial plateau fracture is going to make a big difference. Okay. So, and not uncommonly with these plateau fractures, you're going to have, uh, if they're non displaced, they're going to look pretty. The, the radiographs are going to look pretty good. You're not going to see a, a big fracture unless it's grossly displaced. These non displaced tibial plateau fractures can look pretty normal on x ray. So, this is a patient I had at clinic that was seeing an ER. X rays red as normal, look pretty normal. Um, but they couldn't walk. They had really bad swelling, couldn't put any weight on their knee, and they're having a really hard time. So, um, I threw a probe on there. Um, you can see here, so this is that patient. So if you look at the right hand this is what I saw with my ultrasound, you know, because I, you know, I basically told my could be a small fracture, could be a PCL. Um, and this is what I saw. So then I compare this to the CT that was later later um, performed. And um, you can see there's a pretty obvious tibial plateau fracture there. And again, the management totally changes. So um, so it's really nice. The ultrasound can make a big difference. This is something you can do in the ER if you're not really sure. You just take a quick look at the cortex. It looks fine, then you can be pretty pretty reassured. Okay, and that kind of saves you from having to get CT scan. Okay, so again, tibial plateau fracture can cause a huge tumor fibrosis. Um, and then you know, a lot of times we'll have these patients come to the ER with just a plain old swollen knee. Okay, see it all the time. Um, this is basically a kind of a diagram of that of that knee capsule, knee joint capsule that you will see. Um, and you can see, if you look here in the picture, um, this this superpella bursa. Um, really, it does connect with the synovial cavity and knee joint, so it really is one of the same. So when there's a big effusion, this capsule is really going to extend pretty pretty proximal to this to this patella. And if you look at an ultrasound, this is kind of what you see. So if you have a big knee effusion, you're going to see this hyp hypocote region kind of extending. Here's your quadriceps tendon, kind of extending all the way up in here. And this is a really easy way to see effusion. You turn the probe 90 degrees, and you can see again this big old effusion sitting around the knee. Okay. And, you know, and that's nice. So, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about training this, but, you know, when I was going through my training, I was taught to the drain is blind and you can do that. But if you do an ultrasound guidance, you almost can't, which is really nice. Okay. So, and we're going to talk about this a little bit. So, something else patients come in frequently in the ER is they come in with, with posterior knee pain and swelling. So, for us, you know, what's important is we don't miss a blood clot. Okay. So, I feel like 90% of ultrasounds we get on these patients that are negative for DVTs do often show a Baker cyst. Okay, so again, something we can do really fast bedside, you can take a look. It generally sits on the medial side of the knee in between the conventosis tendon and the medial gastrocnemius here, and it kind of out pouches from the capsule there. Very common, it's a very common cause of posterior knee pain, it can cause calf swelling, especially when it ruptures, it can cause severe calf swelling. Um, and that's really nice. You can do an ultrasound and see that real, real easily. This is kind of what it looks like. Okay, so again, you can put on the back of the knee. You can see this big old hypocoic region, and it's a, a really easy way to diagnose this and open cyst. Okay, so um, so this um, is a uh, very well, I guess not popular anymore, but this is Victor Cruz. He was a receiver for the Giants. Um, he had this injury. This is not his knee radiograph, but this is a radiograph that would look what it would look like had I somehow obtained his radiograph, which obviously I would do that, but um, this is likely what his radiograph looks like. So you can see this. He was uh, playing in the game, had a sudden pop, and then no longer could walk or extend his leg. If you can see, this is a pretty pretty non-subtle finding of patella alta, which is very concerning for a patella tendon rupture. Okay, so this is something I, I also like to do, and I always tell our residents when I see someone with acute knee pain in the ER, you've got to make sure they can extend their knee. You got to make sure they have decent muscle strength and if they don't, <clears throat> pardon me, if they have a hard time doing that or they're not really conform or uh, you know, they're not giving you good effort on their exam, a quick thing to do is just a quick ultrasound to look at the uh, this is This is something more often than not, believe it or not, is, is missed pretty frequently, um, or I should say not frequently in the ER because we just didn't check the infection mechanism. And, and sometimes these will show up in the office two, three weeks later. Uh, with a with a patellar tendon rupture, which is a significant thing, and they're they're going to have all kinds of complications long term. So a quick way to do that, and I do this kind of frequently, is I just throw an ultrasound there. You can show that patellar tendon is intact, and then um, and then you can be rest assured that there's nothing to that effect, and then you can send them on their way. Okay. And again, so if you have a patellar tendon rupture, this is likely something along the lines of what it's going to look like. 
you have normal cellar tenant here, nice pillar structure, and over here you can see a pretty obvious uh, disruption of that tenant complex. Okay, so again, super easy thing to do, and anyone can do it, can enter pretty quickly. Okay, on the flip side of that, this is Tony Parker. He's a former basketball player for the uh, the San Antonio Spurs. Um, this again is not his radiograph. I highly doubt that he's got this arthrosclerosis in his knee, but this is likely what his knee X-ray looked like. Um, he had a quadriceps rupture. Okay, again, this is somewhere you know. As I'm also checking the pillar tendon, I also like to go over the top and check, check the quadriceps tendon because again, this doesn't have a high amount of uh, morbidity if this is not fixed on a, in a pretty quick manner. Okay, then they can have a lot of atrophy and have all kinds of long-term effects. So. Again, I will also take the probe. I'll look at the quadriceps tendon. Here you can see a pretty obvious disruption in that quadriceps tendon here. You can lose your connection to the, to the patella here. Okay, so um, this is another example of what it would look like. Um, here's the tendon retracted here. Here's another piece here, hematoma here. And then again, you don't have that connection there. So again, it's a really easy thing to do, pretty easy thing to catch with ultrasound and not infrequently missed in the ER. Okay, so um, other things we can do is we do more diagnostic ultrasound looking at Achilles tendonitis. These are going to be little more common locations of pain. Um, you know, and like we showed earlier, or like, you know, like I talked about earlier, you have a totally normal Achilles tendon here, a nice pillar structure. And if you look over here, um, pretty, pretty symptomatic. You have all this fluid kind of sitting around this tendon here. And this is a pretty symptomatic Achilles tendonopathy or tendonitis. Okay. You know, we don't always need to do radiographs. It's pretty fast. You can just throw an ultrasound on there, make sure that the tendon looks intact. And show the long fluid and you tell the patient, look, it's like, you know, this is like your Achilles tendon, you can follow up. We don't have to do any initial imaging. This is another example of what an Achilles tendonitis would look like. This is more of a mid substance tendonitis, or more, I guess you could say this is more of a tendinopathy. Very common to have that in the mid substance. And you can actually see some pretty swollen uh, mid substance Achilles tendons there. Again, throw a probe on there, super easy to diagnose, send them on their way. Okay. Another uh, common area to have pain is kind of this lateral ankle pain. Especially this old, you'll see a lot of this after um, ankle sprains. They keep having this lateral pain that's really bothersome for them. You know, they kind of locate the distal fibula. They've had x rays, they've been negative. It's like, you know, continue to complain, continue pain. Again, really easy to throw a probe on there. Okay, so you don't really need to repeat radiographs unless you think it's clinically necessary. You can always just throw an ultrasound on there. Again, you can see normal, normal uh, fibularis or perineal tendons, whichever name you like to use. And then you have pretty symptomatic. So you got a lot of fluid sitting around the tendons here. And this again is someone who's got some very symptomatic lateral ankle pain. Okay. Um, this is uh, Kevin Durant. He's a uh, basketball player for the Warriors. I'm not sure if you guys recall, but he had a pretty significant injury. Um, I'm going to show you guys a video real quick. Matt, can you guys see this video okay? Okay, perfect. So um, I love this video because they show this on ESPN probably 500 times when this happened. But you can see here, you can see right where you felt it. Take the step, pop. And you know, these uh, these are pretty, not very subtle. I'm gonna stop this share, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. You know, it's, uh, one second. It's YouTube, so you can't actually put these in your PowerPoint. Matt, is it back on my PowerPoint? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. So, you know, these um, are usually not very subtle presentations. Usually they'll come in and they'll tell you exactly what happened. Um, you know, you get radiographs, they're negative, they don't really show you much. Um, but then, you know, you get an MRI, it's pretty obvious. You don't necessarily have to MRI these, especially in the ER. Pretty easy. Um, you know, certainly you can do your physical examination finding, which we should all do, and we should all be pretty good at, which is your your Thompson test. And it's when they have a torn Achilles, it's usually pretty obvious on exam. Um, but again, you can show the patient. If you, if you put a probe on there, again, normal Achilles tendon on the left. If you look at it right, there's this very big, obvious disruption here with the retraction of both ends and filled with that hypochloric hematoma. Okay, so um, you can also see partial tears. So, you know, sometimes if it feels like it's intact, you're your Thompson test is negative. It feels like it's there, but they're having a lot of pain back there. Throw a probe on there, and you can see this pretty significant partial tear of this of this Achilles tendon. Um, 
So this was one of our, uh, she's one of our attendees now, but she was a uh, resident at the time. She sent me these videos. Uh, I love these videos because you can see a very obvious um, patel, um, Achilles tendon tear, which is pretty cool. And she was, right now, she's trying to do a Thompson test under ultrasound. You can see this proximal portion on the left side of your screen is kind of moving and the distal portion, nothing at all. And that's just because it's totally disrupted. And then she also did a short axis view as she was sliding up and down the tendon. You can see, again, this very large, obvious disruption here, which is pretty nice. And again, it's, you know, it's an easy test, fast test, and pretty obvious findings, which is cool. Um, something I, I also see, I see in the ER several times, see in my clinic all the time, is, is patients that come and they tell me they tore their Achilles. A lot of times they have these medial gastrocnemius tears or tennis leg, also very common. And again, something you can diagnose real, real easy, real quick in the, in the ER. You can just throw the probe on their calf, throw it on the, the normal side, and then throw it on the abnormal side. You can see this very obvious hematoma tear right in that muscle between these junctions there, which is nice, easy diagnosis there. Again, plantar fasciitis is something else that also sounds great to diagnose. Uh, radiographs, um, oftentimes in normal, sometimes you see this little spur. You can throw an ultrasound on there, and you can see this very abnormal. Um, Plantar fascia, plantar fascia here as compared to asymptomatic on the left hand side here and then very symptomatic on the right, very small plantar fascia, which is nice. Okay. Um, they come in with this proximal shoulder pain, you worry about biceps tendon. Um, you know, and they come in and they're talking about this uh, pain in their in their shoulder and their bicep. You know, and you worry about this proximal, this proximal bicep tendon tear, which sounds really easy to diagnose that, you know. Um, Something real simple. So you have a normal bicep tendon here on the left hand side of the screen. And then you look here on the right hand side, you either have it totally torn me, and, and retracted. So there's really nothing in that groove there whatsoever. Or you can have it torn and just kind of balled up in that little area. And you see this kind of hyperploic um, heterogeneous structure here. And that's just really the tendon torn and retracted into that, into that groove, which is really nice again, super easy diagnosis. Okay. Um, on the same side of that, they come with this anterior shoulder pain, really bothersome for them. Um, and then you can see the very obvious proximal bicep tendonitis here. Again, normal on the left, upper right. Sometimes it's super obvious like this, sometimes a little less obvious, but you'll see some fluid around here. And uh, both of these are symptomatic. It's just one, this one is much more um, apparent on ultrasound. You see that little bicep screw there, it's not even been there, it's so swollen and pulled out. And so that's really nice to get easy diagnosis to make. So, um, something else we see a lot of in the ER are these, these shoulder injuries, rotator cuff tears. The most common is going to be your supraspinatus muscle tendon, which kind of sits right on the top of the shoulder. That is, without a doubt, the most common rotator cuff injury you're going to have. Um, really easy view. You have them kind of get in that what we call the gunslinger position. You bring your probe that top side of the shoulder, and this is what your normal supraspinatus tendon is going to look like. Um, both the left hand side of the screen and long axis and short axis on the right hand side of the screen. You don't see any tears. This looks Totally normal and totally fine. As opposed to when you have tears, you can see, you know, if you look at a diagram here, you can see what, you know, uh, illustration is going to look like. If you look at an ultrasound, normal up here, you can see a pretty significant tear and retraction here. Okay, again, um, you know, these acute injuries, acute tears, you're going to see this hypochoic space, basically absence of that tendon filled with hematoma. Okay, and it's pretty easy to see. Okay, AC joint, another common area, you know, you have bicycle truck falls in the shoulder. And simple falls off the bike on their shoulder. Um, they get this really irritated AC joint. Um, and you can see here, uh, symptomatic versus asymptomatic. So on the right hand side of the screen, it's totally asymptomatic. It's normal, it's nice and smooth, a little bit of fluid there is totally normal. But you look at the other side of the screen, you can see there's a little bit of separation here. You have a little bit of bleeding. So it's going to give it that heterogeneous appearance as you get that, um, that debris in there. Okay, so again, asymptomatic, symptomatic. And again, if you look at something that looks a little, a little concerning for you, just look at the other side of the asymptomatic. It could be totally normal. It could be totally abnormal. Okay. So shoulder dislocations, always going to talk about this. Uh, this is one of my favorite uses for ultrasound in the ER is when you're looking at shoulder dislocations and reductions. This is what a normal shoulder ultrasound is going to look like. It's not the greatest picture, but basically you're going to see, um, you're going to see the glenohumeral joint here. You're going to see the scapula. You're going to see labrum in here, and you're going to see the head of the humerus sitting here. Okay, this is a normal non dislocated shoulder. Okay, in an anterior dislocation, which is what we see much more frequently, you're going to see this humerus kind of below. You're going to see the, the glenoid here. You're going to see the head of the humerus kind of deep below. Again, it's artifact. You're going to see this little bright lit area. And then you're generally where this ultrasound is done, you're going to see this 
in for us today this one across kind of holds on for dear life down here uh, but that you're going to see that it hasn't been as deep um, because that anterior dislocation on, on the opposite side as with the posterior dislocation obviously far less common and much more commonly missed if you do an ultrasound here um, you can see where this has a humerus looks proximal to the screen or, or superficial um, you have your glenoid deep and it kind of comes up and just kind of dislocated and sits on the top and I'm comparing that to radiographs here. Um, if you look at a radiograph on the top right hand side of your screen, this is pretty commonly missed. If you just do an AP view, it's, it's pretty easy to miss these. Uh, if you do a CT, uh, this is the same patient, by the way, all three of these pictures. Um, CT definitely showed this shoulder. This, this gentleman had, had a shoulder dislocation for about four weeks by the time he came in. So, um, you know, and a quick ultrasound would have missed it, which is nice. So, um, that's a, just a kind of a brief overview of um, the pathology you're going to see. I did want to talk briefly about um, these ultrasound guided procedures. You can do pretty easily in the ER as well. Um, and we're going to talk about these ones in particular. So, um, I, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how, how you guys do hematoma blocks, but I'll tell you how I was taught to do a hematoma block when I was in residency was literally um, take the needle, insert the skin, and literally just walk up the bone until you hit it where, there's, where it's soft. Okay. And, you know, that seems a little bit barbaric to me. Uh, patients hated it because they would literally feel that needle walk down that whatever, you know, whatever bone there, you know, more, more commonly the, the distal radius. And they hated it. I hated doing it. Um, whereas if you do it with ultrasound, super easy. So I've done this in my clinic a few times. It's only coming with a pre-displaced fracture that I, that I could manipulate and put in place myself without sedating them. I've done this a few times where you just do an ultrasound, find that area, the hematoma, and let's literally take a small needle, put it right there. It's much more comfortable for the patient and it works pretty well. Then, you know, let it sit for about 10 minutes and then you can form a, form a main introduction and they're pretty well controlled, which is nice. Um, something else I did want to talk about was an electronine bursa aspiration. Yeah, this is a little bit controversial whether or not you should do this. Um, a lot of times, to be honest with you, when you do this, it comes right back. But what's important is if you ever see this, there's erythema or you're worried about an infection, it's a nice procedure to do to get some of that fluid off to send it for studies. Okay. So, Really easy. You just take the probe. You know, certainly you do it under sterile conditions, but you take the probe. You get a nice long axis view of that bursa, and then you look under the machine or on your on your screen. You can see that needle drop right into that fluid space. It's almost impossible to miss this. So it's a super easy procedure to do. Works pretty well. Ultrasound guidance works great. Okay. Same thing with the knee aspiration. Kind of like I talked about earlier briefly, is that when you have these patients, you know, again, this is something I was taught to do blind, and that, and that works well if they have a big effusion. But if they have a pretty small effusion, it's pretty easy to miss these, you know, and you, you feel it, you're pretty certain you're in the right spot, trying to pull fluid, you're not getting much luck. Um, you know, it works really well to do this ultrasound. You, know, you can do it, you can do a picture, you can see where your needle drops right in that fluid. Um, sometimes you can even have some synovium that kind of the needle gets caught on. So a good way to see if that's happening is do an ultrasound. You can see if it's caught there. Really easy to do. Again, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to miss. Uh, knee aspiration when you, when you use ultrasound. Whereas if you do a blind, you can miss. You can see places you don't think you are. Okay, so it's a really easy procedure to do, really fast, doesn't really add any time to the prep, if you ask me. Okay, another thing that, that uh, I'll do pretty often uh, in, in my clinic, at least, you can also do an ER too, it doesn't really matter. It's a Baker Sims aspiration. Okay, super easy to do. You take the probe, you look at the back of the knee, you find that open space. Um, certainly, you want to look at it with Doppler first, to make sure you're not actually putting a needle in a an aneurysm because that can be pretty bad. Um, but you know, do Doppler, make sure it's not vascular, and then drop a needle in there. And come in. It's super, super easy. Okay. And then patients feel much, much better after this, which is nice. Um, I did also want to talk briefly about some shoulder procedures. These are things that, that I've done both in the ER and, and in my clinic. Um, but these are also very nice and easy for this patient. So clinic humoral joint injection. Um, you know, similar to how you hold your permutation for a dislocation, um, you kind of hold it in that transverse plane, um, and then you come in laterally. And what you'll see here is you kind of drop this needle directly at the joint. Here's a nice illustration of something you can um, If you have your permutation kind of going lateral here, um, you can see on the image, you have your needle that kind of drops in here, and it goes directly in this joint right here. And then nice little illustration shows this little one joint you can kind of inject. So if I'm doing a dislocation reduction, I really try not to state these. I will oftentimes do a clinical humoral joint injection, put medication in here, and it makes it a lot easier, nicer for patients. So it's a super easy procedure to do. Just hold your probe, hold your needle, and you know, again, you almost can't miss. Um, 
subacromial injections we do all the time. Uh, again, you take your probe, put it on top of the shoulder, put in this long axis view, and you can drop your needle, and you can very easily see your needle just drop right in to the bursa. Super easy to do, and patients love it um, because you're not kind of just putting a needle on there and hoping to get in the right spot. You can put it exactly where you want it to be, which is really good because it's really important, especially not to put this needle and inject a bunch of steroid directly in or medication directly into the tendon because that can cause issues over a long period of time or it can actually cause some tearing of the tendon as well. You want to put in that little bursa, this little, this little fluid filled sac right here, which is nice because it helps it quite a bit. AC joints, super easy again. You just kind of put your probe and long axis over the joint here, and then you just drop your needle on short axis. And then, you know, much like if we're doing a ultrasound guided central line or an IV, you drop your needle short axis, and you can see it light up right here. Once you see it's there, you know you're in the right spot, inject the medication, and uh, they're much, much happier. Okay. Biceps tendon sheath, also very similar. Take a picture here, short axis of the tendon, drop your needle long axis, and this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, what's important here is there's this little artery that normally sits on the medial or lateral aspect of the tendon here. It's more commonly on the medial side. Just know that's there and just try to avoid that. It'll sit right there. You'll see a little pulsating hypochloric region here. Um, other than that, you can kind of inject and just carry tendon in face. And again, patients love it. They feel great. Easy to do with ultrasound. Okay. So um, to wrap up, I think our time is pretty good. Um, again, in brief discussion, you, you know, things you can see, you can see fractures, dislocations, you know, kind of all these things, tendon injuries, ligament injuries, nerves. Um, but also nice is you can be really dynamic and, and uh, do dynamic procedures, which is really good. Okay, so uh, a lot of pictures, references. Um, here's my actual references from uh, the Jacobson Book of uh, Musculoskeletal Ultrasound, which is kind of like the Bible that we all use. Um, and um, that said, any questions? And I'll leave that up and say thank you. And I'll leave it up for questions. Well, thanks, Ben. Thanks for that uh, a wonderful summary of kind of musculoskeletal ultrasound, kind of all a bunch of things that we can do uh, that have practical impact to the bedside. So it's definitely appreciate you coming over and talking to us. No uh, problem like, at all. Like Ben said, anybody with questions, now's your chance to ask the MSK expert you know, all your burning MSK questions. <laughs>